This video was made possible by Denali Data Technologies. Denali is a private biotech company working on technologies to drive DNA-based data storage system scalability. To learn more about Denali, check out the link in the description. Hi, and welcome to Socratic Studios. This episode, we talk to Kyle Tomic, a graduate student from NC State University, about the field of DNA data storage. We discussed what DNA data storage is, how it works, and its applications, as well as the work Mr. Tomic is doing to advance the field. Welcome, Mr. Tomic. It's an honor to have you as our guest. Uh, hi, Vishnu. Uh, my name is Kyle Tomek. I'm a, a PhD researcher at NC State University studying DNA-based data storage systems. Um, I've been working in the field for roughly five years. Um, and I'm excited to share uh, my knowledge with you today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mr. Tomic, for that introduction. So um, what is DNA data storage and how does it work? Yeah, that's a uh, good question right off the bat. Um, DNA-based data storage, uh, basically you can take a digital file, which is typically stored on a flash drive, a uh, computer hard drive or magnetic tape drive, and basically take that data and write it into synthetic strands of DNA. Um, to do that, there's um, a few steps of the process. Uh, the first is encoding. And so that's where we can take a file, which are currently read on a computer as uh, binary code in zeros and ones. And so that's a two letter language. Um, and basically what we do in DNA based data storage is convert that two letter of zero and one to a four letter system, uh, quaternary language of A, C, G, and T of DNA. And so just like translating um, basically English to Spanish or Russian to Chinese, something like that, we can translate binary to quaternary. Um, and so there are simple methods to do that, simple translations, um, but then there's more complex translations as well. Um, to those confer um, different data densities and different storage reliability as well. Um, the second step of the um, process is synthesis, and this is where we build the strands of DNA that encode that data base by base. And so it's synthetic DNA. It's custom made in a lab. It's not um, doesn't encode any genetic information or doesn't come from any human or animal cells or anything like that. Um, and to do that, there's a widely known reaction that's kind of used across the country, across the world in biolabs, um, and that's phosphoramidite synthesis. Um, and currently, that synthesis method is actually the slowest and most expensive step of the whole entire DNA storage process. So that's the limiting factor right now. Um, so but once we have the strands made, uh, we store them um, mostly just in water-based solution, and we store that into a fridge or freezer, something like that. Um, we could also dry it out into a powdered form and store that that way. Um, and there's also groups working on um, more advanced storage technologies um, to increase the durability of DNA. Um, once everything is stored, we also need to be able to access our, stra our strands and our files of interest. And so uh, there's a few ways to do that. And one simple way to do it is just sequence out everything you, that you have. And so you, you would be reading out all of the data that you have stored. Um, but there's also, also methods to be able to access specific files of interest. Um, and that's known as random access in computer systems. So that, that name has kind of carried through to DNA storage. Um, once we have the files of interest, uh, we can send them for DNA sequencing. And so a lot of the work of the Human Genome Project has developed DNA sequencing platforms to be faster and more widely used. Um, you can think of genome sequencing companies like 23andMe or something like that, where you send your DNA in and they sequence it. It would be similar where we send the DNA strands um, and those sequencers will read out base by base um, that code of DNA. And then once we have that code on a computer, we can then reverse translate basically back to the binary code. Um, and so that's the, the entire process um, in a, as brief as I can be, <laughs> nutshell. Do you think you could explain the, the process of translation, how you translate the, the binary system to this quaternary system? 
So um, I can give you uh, my explanation. Um, I do work on the synthetic biology side of things, and we have collaborators in the computational um, engineering and computer science side. Um, the, um, the easiest way to think about this translation is the most simple way to do it is an A would be zero, zero, a C would be zero, one, a G would be one, zero, and a T would be one, one. So that's a direct translation from zero and one to the ACGT. And that's the simplest way to do it. Um, but there's no redundancy there and there's no um, extra reliability built into that. So we can take um, encoding schemes that are used widely in computational systems now. So something like Reed Solomon encoding, where you basically pad your sequence of data with extra data to make it more reliable and make it less error prone. And so we, um, while we could use those simple, most dense forms of that translation, we usually use something that's a little bit more complicated, but we'll pad the data and make it more reliable and more easily read out at the end, at the end of things. So you could essentially translate any base system, right? And uh, a base of any numbers theoretically. Yes, we could. And there's, there's work uh, being done also to increase the number of letters in the DNA based system. And so um, there are these synthetic bases that people are working with to try to add a fifth base pair or a sixth base pair, which would also increase the complexity and density of the DNA based language. So I was wondering, what are the applications of DNA based data storage? Why is it useful? Yeah, with this question, I usually like to start with the why is it useful because it kind of blew me away to begin with. And I, I think it does that to a lot of people. So um, the main thing is that DNA is extremely dense. Um, it's because the way DNA can be stored in this totally disorganized and totally free floating way where the DNA is not bound to any physical scaffold or anything like that. With this, If you think about a computer chip, there's this like silicon chip where these transistors are sitting at. Um, so there's a physical structure limiting the density of computer chip where DNA can be stored totally free floating in a, in a fluid. And so DNA can be up to or more than a million times more dense than any current storage technology that's out there today. And so um, one number that I tried to calculate and I hope it's accurate is that if you had one gallon of DNA based data storage solution, you would need 150 Olympic sized swimming pools of liquid or of space with the most dense technology out there today to store the same amount of information. And so we're getting this crazy orders of magnitude increase in density. So we're just reducing the size of things um, to be able to store that much information. Um, another thing is that DNA is super durable when it's stored in the proper conditions. Um, hard drives and these magnetic tape drives need to be like fixed or scrubbed or replaced every like 10 years or so. Um, but DNA can be stable um, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and it's not the perfect example, but I like to think um, there's this paper recently that came out that basically they were able to sequence some DNA from this horse that's been dead and fossilized for 700,000 years. And so the potential for DNA to have this really long shelf life is also one of the, the huge benefits. Um, and then kind of going along with both of those things is that DNA is really energy efficient as well. So once it's stored, um, there's little energy and space to maintain it. So these storage facilities that house um, tape drives and um, these huge hard drive uh, data storage facilities need to be climate controlled and they consume a bunch of water and energy because of that, where DNA um, Theoretically, you could just dry it out into a powder form and then just like go bury it in the backyard <laughs> and uh, you would end up being, uh, you don't have to use like any energy to do that and it would be stable for years and years. Um, so because it's so useful, like those are the useful aspects of it. Um, there is one really obvious um, field and application for it and that's archival based data storage. Um, where you need to store a lot of data, but it's not that frequently accessed. And so Amazon Glacier um, is an example of this cloud uh, storage or um, tape-based storage where um, 
you can send them a lot of your data, terabytes, petabytes of data, and it doesn't cost that much to store it, but it costs a lot to access it. And so DNA can uh, potentially be a disruptor to a market like that or an enhancer to a market like that, where now we can store even more data. Um, <clears throat> a smaller, more niche market is something I think it's really interesting. Um, it's called uh, like object provenance or like basically tracking where products came from. Um, and one example of that I like to, to think about or share is that um, when uh, producing a car, you could basically embed the data of that, what that car is into like the paint or the plastic that's used to make it. So like the VIN number and the owner information could be stored inside the plastic. And so if there were, ever was like some sort of hit and run accident or something like that, you could actually just sequence the DNA that's in those chips of paint and find out who the person was who owned that car or where that car came from. Um, it's also um, possible to embed pharmaceuticals with DNA information um, where um, it's it's not harmful to ingest the DNA, but it would uh, allow you to track where the pharmaceuticals came from and um, really make sure that none of these far, uh, counterfeit pharmaceuticals are coming out at all. So that's also a, a smaller niche market versus just storing a bunch of DNA like uh, archival storage. Sure. Um, so you mentioned how uh, DNA data storage is much more dense than anything we currently have. Are there any efforts to sort of mimic the, the structure of DNA? So like a biomimicry effort rather than just using DNA itself? Um, there are different um, researchers out there working on a few different things um, with data storage in general. Um, one off the top of my head is basically taking um, a bunch of different small molecules, a bunch of different chemicals, and basically storing them in a solution. And then using mass spectrometry, you would be able to figure out what molecules are in that solution and therefore decode the data that's stored in those molecules. Um, Another thing I kind of mentioned already is that um, there's effort to increase the, the library of DNA bases. And so instead of just ACGT actually increasing the number of base pairs from uh, four bases to five, six, eight, ten bases. Um, and then another interesting thing is that um, the DNA backbone is one of the things that does degrade the most readily, I guess. So like um, it's not the most stable part of the structure, um, and it is prone to breakage if the strands are too long and things like that. And so I think there's efforts out there to actually um, basically uh, self-make or build from the ground up using a different type of backbone um, in, a, in a molecule similar to DNA. So where do you get the, the DNA from? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, once we have the the DNA encoded. So on a computer, we can look at it as ACGT, ACGT, and so on. Um, what we do is actually build the strands base by base using just the block monomers. So we um, say that the sequence is ACGT. We start with a, a, a scaffold, um, and then we add an A to the bottom. And then to that, we add a C, to that, add a G, and then add a T. So it's base by base synthesis. And that's this phosphoramidite synthesis. Um, in our lab specifically, we don't personally do that synthesis method. We actually outsource it to different companies. And depending on how complex the DNA that we're ordering is, we can order um, different amounts from different companies. And so there's a lot of um, basically vendors or companies who supply a lot of bio labs um, across the world with their customized DNA. And it's not really different than that besides the fact that we're ordering just much, much more of it for storing data. So on to um, your work specifically, what issue with DNA data storage were you trying to solve? That's a, a really good question and something that uh, it kind of came up um, while we were looking at a different issue. Um, and so uh, the main the main way that we organize and we name and then we eventually access DNA from stored molecules um, is using polymerase chain reaction. And so PCR, 
Um, what we do is add in a very small sequence that will bind to the main sequences of interest. And then it allows a polymerase, an enzyme, to copy those strands of interest. Um, so the way we um, both name and access the DNA is using those PCR primers. And um, PCR primer space is this interesting space where basically we use something around 20 base pairs. Um, so it's four bases to 20 base pairs. Um, long and so there's a about a trillion different potential primer sequences that are possible out of that space but when you start thinking about how those sequences interact it quickly becomes very limited in how many that we can use at a given time and so we can only out of the like one trillion potential primers we can only use a few thousand at a time and so the idea is that we name our files based on those sequences so we can only really store a few thousand files or like chunks of data at a given time. And so when you're looking to store like a ton of data, a mass amount of data, only being able to store 30, like 3000 chunks is a limiting factor. And so um, when we were discussing this issue, we kind of had this like weird aha moment where uh, we thought we're throwing away like 99.99999% of these sequences what can we do with the ones that we're actually getting rid of right now? Because they're, we're not using them. They're not being useful. And so, um, and so it kind of changed our game plan of, okay, instead of solving how to increase the number that we can use at a given time, it's, Hey, let's like try to use these ones for some sort of function, um, that we're just currently just throwing away and totally disregarding. How, how did you go about solving this issue? That's another good question because um, uh, I think in a lot of molecular biology labs, there's a lot of like secret knowledge that kind of gets passed down while you're getting trained um, in these molecular biology techniques. Um, a lot of the stuff and a lot of the steps are kind of hard to put into words or into this like explicit protocol. And so I think this project specifically kind of arose from those con conversations and discussions about these protocols. and. Um, I always think that there's this like black magic or this like voodoo that goes on with like getting a PCR to work. Sometimes it just randomly doesn't work, but um, basically you can say, okay, are you getting this target, this amplification that you weren't expecting? Increase the temperature of this step, or do you want something that's more specific? Uh, try adding this reagent or that reagent. And while there's like some literature out there of, like what those explicitly are. Um, it's a lot of optimization given a specific uh, reaction that you're running. Um, but we kind of took those ideas and, and typically we're trying to, in a bio lab, you're trying to get more specific product and only the thing that you're super interested in, where we kind of flipped that around and said, okay, yes, we want to get what we're interested in, but we're also interested in the things that are really closely related to it as well. And so we're actually trying to increase the amount of nonspecific interactions uh, versus decrease those inter interactions. Um, and so we kind of took normal methodology and normal thought processes in our bio lab and kind of flipped them around and kind of tackled the issue that way. So on, on the surface level, it um, kind of seems like you're making the problem more or not the problem, but the process more complex. but you're actually trying to make the user experience more simple and easier. Um, wh why do you think it seems more complex than, than it really is? Yeah, um, I think, um, while I'm not an expert in computer systems or operating systems, I think that goes on a lot in those, these systems where if you can write a more complex code that can do better or more elegant computations or calculations, like in the background, so the user is not actually seeing it happen or it's happening more, happening more quickly. It might be more complicated, but it can happen more quickly than like the user is not actually seeing what's going on in the background. Um, I think that happens a lot in a lot of computer systems. And so, yeah, I mean, you're like kind of hit the nail on the head that uh, we made the system a lot more complicated 
And a lot of times that led to a lot of frustration in the lab, running these reactions and trying to get them to work and troubleshoot them and optimize them. But in the end, I think it does confer this like nice, more easy to use system um, where um, basically if you store a group of files, like if I store a group of files the next week, sometimes I'll look at a file and go, I don't know what that file is. Like I forget what the name is or how I named it or something like that. And so I'll have to open it up and read it to make sure I know what it is. Now imagine storing uh, information for years and centuries on end, like the user, the end user is not going to be the person who stored it. And so being able to quickly read it and figure out what it is without having to see the whole entire file and take up a lot of time um, is something that, uh, takes a lot of complexity up front, but it makes that end user experience a lot, uh, quicker and potentially cheaper as well. So it's sort of like, um, giving people an abstract to read r rather than the entire research paper. You're, you're kind of giving them a brief summary. That's exactly right. Um, we did it with image files where it went from blurry to higher resolution, but we also thought about it with text files. Yeah, you just give them the title or an abstract instead of the whole entire paper where um, a lot of times I'll read an abstract and get all the information I need and don't need to read the whole paper. Or I'll read the abstract and go, hey, this is a super interesting paper. Let me open the whole thing and get all the supplementary data and things like that. So that's, an, that's a great example. What are you looking to do in the future to advance your work? Um, that's a, a really big question. Um, I think that the field is, is so young and um, exciting that that can be answered a lot of different ways. Um, but something that we've, my group at NC State has always kind of dreamed about is taking this idea from the library, basically, we're reading about it and studying it and trying to plan for it, taking it from there into the lab and then eventually into the hands of everyday people. Um, I think when I first was starting, I remember daydreaming and thinking about like, like, hey, eventually, potentially we'll be able to have so much data, just like all of the world's data in this really small form and everyone is going to be able to have it like basically in their pocket. I mean, if you think about like, I mean, even like 20 years ago, like when the internet was really like getting popular and things like that, and computers were starting to like be in every house across the country. I don't think anybody really thought about like, oh, one day um, we're going to have these supercomputers in our pocket who can, that can connect us to the entire planet, like in the blink of an eye. And so I think eventually there's going to be this like seismic jump in DNA based data storage and DNA computation that takes it like to these un unthinkable places. And I think it's just super cool to be able to work in a field that has that type of um, potential for it. So on a final note, what about DNA data storage gets you the most excited? Yeah, I mean, I think I tried to touch on it with that last uh, answer, but I think it's just the potential of it. Um, I think using these really understood systems and these really fundamentally um, easy and relatively simple systems to create this like orders of magnitude increase in data density and data capacity is just incredible. Um, yeah. And I think, um, what's really exciting right now is that there's this, there's a field being formed and there's actually a group of scientists and researchers and companies that's kind of forming this alliance of data storage. So it's called the, uh, DNA data storage Alliance, um, started by Microsoft and Illumina and Twist and I think one other company, Western Digital maybe, where actually now all these researchers working on DNA storage are coming together and kind of putting their brains together instead of working in isolation. Now the, the field is becoming united and that's a super, I think, exciting time um, for this very young field to be kind of aggregating and bringing all of our knowledge together to make the, the field grow faster into the future. Sounds good. Um, 
those are basically all of the questions I had. Uh, thank you so much for speaking with, well, with me today. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, I had a great time. Uh, I love sharing the information that I've been working on uh, for five years. I've been had, had my head in the book, so it's great to be sharing with us, sharing that with the world. And um, Vishnu, thank you for giving me uh, the platform to do that. So I had a great time.